Welcome back to Ask the Educator, a podcast for all professionals involved in medical device processing and sponsored by Healthmark Industries. The education team here at Healthmark has 280 years of combined experience in areas ranging from sterile processing, endoscopy, OR, biomed, to hospital and industry leadership. Our goal is to leverage our collective experience to answer one of your questions each episode, giving you the practical tips you need to succeed in the evolving world of device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, clinical educator here at Healthmark, and I will be your host. Let's get started. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Ask the Educator. Stephen Kovac joins me again as we continue along on our 10 Factors of Cleaning series. The last one, we talked about water, and this one sort of dovetails into that one, to use uh, Stephen's term. Hmm. But this one, we want to start talking about concentration and dilution. So, Stephen, can you just kind of introduce us to this concept as a, a 10 Factors of Cleaning for us? Sure. Well, let's get the the definition out first. Dilution, you go and open um, Webster's or a science or chemistry book. It's really a, a process of decreasing the concentration of the solute, in this case for us, the cleaning solution or a disinfectant or whatever, usually by simply mixing with it more solvent, like adding more water to the solution. So to dilute a solution means to add more solvent without adding more solute. It's that simple. So why is this a factor of clean? We use cleaning solutions in what we do. And now we've got to put these other factors together. Water quality, pH, alkalinity, temperature. We're going to talk about cleaning solutions in a minute. You put it all together so you can have these cleaning solutions work properly. So you need good quality water. You're going to have lots of choices when it comes to cleaning solutions. Each of them have their own pluses and minuses. We're not here to talk about it, but when you talk about, you know, why is company A better than company B or company C? But in general, in the United States, people use enzyme-based detergents. And there's four, basically, that are used or a combo. Lipase, which breaks down fats and grease. Protease, which breaks down protein. Cellulase, which breaks down wood, cotton, and paper. Why do you bring this up? Well, there's still some departments that report to the director of laundry. And there are, might be some listeners who are working in a laundry department, and they would use, understand they need a cellulose-type enzyme to break down some things. And then there's amylase that breaks down carbohydrates and starches. Why bring that up? Some of us wipe down infusion pumps, different things where pump feeders, K pumps with amylase and 2-cal and all that. You've got to know the right cleaning solution. And so then you have your manual detergents. And most of them have to be low foaming, neutral pH. And then you have the type that go in your mechanical your cart washer, your sonic, are they acid or alkaline? If you're in Europe, they use more alkaline detergents. And you got to pick what's suitable for the job. So how do you do that? You need to make sure you have the right dilution. Where do you get that information from? The IFU, the label. You become that label reader again. Why? Because if it says low foaming and you got a lot of foam, there's something wrong with it. And the other thing is, you got to think of the IFU from the manufacturer. That manufacturer, they have to make sure none of their detergent has residual left on devices. Can it be free rinsing, wash away, and so on? So that's the first piece I wanted to talk about. So getting dilution, does it make sense on how I put that part together? We're going to build on two more, Kevin. Yeah, I think that was a good start. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned having the right detergent or the right solution for the right job. I know from a manager's perspective in my former facility, it was my temptation to just use the one, you know, I might have mentioned before, we went to a surfactant based detergent that mm -hmm. was neutral, low foaming, whatever. And it seemed like the great 
thing to cover all items. And the truth of the matter is, unfortunately, when you go back to, say, the IFU, the Da Vinci, as much as I don't necessarily agree or whatever, doesn't matter. It does call for a neutral enzymatic in that uh, IFU. So that being said, we have to be nimble enough to understand that we may have to switch between different detergents at, at, and different solutions yeah. at, at different times based on what we're cleaning. And I think that's really important that you brought that up. I'm going to go on that real quick before I get to this next point. And that's where I think some people don't understand with orthopedic items, they're just using one type of detergent it might be all protease. And I'm not saying to go buy one or the other, but if you're using knees and that synovial fluid, that synovial fluid isn't really protein based. It's something else. And so you might have to match up the right enzyme or the combination of enzymes or use a alkaline detergent, which will clean it. So again, we're giving a basic or introduction. So the next thing people need to know is really the type of water. And we talked about Amy's TIR water document 34, which is going to be a standard. If people have started looking at their IFUs that have been improved in the last year or so, they have to become more specific. They have to either say if you're using utility or critical water. And that's what's important. Your utility water is like your potable water you drink every day. And I want people to be observant. If you're riding down the freeway and you see them fixing the road and they have a big water tank, it will say non-potable water. That means you can't drink it. Or if you go to the cemetery like myself and put flowers on graves for my parents and grandparents and my wife, Anne, and other people, the water will say non-potable, don't drink it. So the first term we need to understand, potable water is waters that have been treated and delivered in a manner so that it meets EPA guidelines as suitable for drinking. That's usually in all the first stages of our cleaning. You use potable water or utility water. Potable water falls under utility water. Three other terms people should know, softened water, that removes ions that cause water to be hard, usually to get rid of calcium and magnesium. But iron ions may also be removed by softening. And then in your department or anybody's department, they either have deionized or RO water. Deionized water, people got to remember they have tanks, usually a red or a green light that it's working. So you got to look every day and be observant. But it's a water treatment process that usually specifically manufactured these resin, ion exchange resin, to remove ionized salts from the water. It's expensive, but the most expensive is RO water. So if we have anybody who's working in dialysis out there, you, they're used to that because that water is usually RO water, and that's a membrane that separates through a process of purifying the water that pushes it through the membrane and keeps things out and in, and it's very, very expensive. And that gets into the critical water. And the critical water is so important, it's the purity. Why is that important? It's for rinsing, whether it's manual or automatic. And we wanna make sure people understand this. On the manual side, you usually have a red and a green color on your handle. If it's red and green, it's hot and cold, right? Oh yeah, right. But now in your department, you're seeing white. What does the white mean usually? Isn't that the critical water? That's the critical water. Yeah. And if you were in a laboratory, they would have a faucet with a white thing for purity to rinse things. So now you're seeing in your department that third spigot, and it's usually by itself with something white on the knob when you turn it, that you know it's either deionized or RO water or it's purity water. And you want that purest water for your final rinse, whether it's the final rinse in your Sonic or your automated washer, that's to remove residual detergent and everything else. Think of it as like a vacuum going over and just pulling everything up. So it's the best it can be. And even thus, when it dries, there's no salts or calcium left. So there's no water spots left. So the purity of your water and understanding those definitions are very important. Does that make sense until I get to the very last third part, Kevin? 
I think that's good, Stephen. And I think something for people to realize is when we're talking about these waters and especially that critical water and how it's important for that to be the last sort of rinse that we use, we also need to make sure that perhaps they're different sources. So we want to make sure both the manual source, the manual cleaning critical water and the automated cleaning critical water are equally tested and monitored for quality and consistency. I know we're approaching some time, Kevin, but this one is tying in these factors. So now I'm going to end up with the last bullet point under dilution. So it's how you dilute. So if you over dilute your chemicals, you could be wasting product time and money and get incorrect results. If you under dilute your chemicals, you could be at risk of having a mixture of solution with a high risk of injury or them not getting as clean. I know we're taught not talking disinfectants here, but the, not having enough disinfectant to do what it's supposed to do. So how do you dilute? You surely don't take the top off and glug, glug, glug and pour it in. You use that pump or you get a proportionator, or I know in your department, you had this little pump, one of the major companies, and your press and gives so many ounces per gallons. Uh, what was dosage thing or something you called it, Kevin? Yeah, they, it automatically dosed it. Yeah. And um, you make sure when you change your chemicals that that pump is good, that silicone tubing over time, the elasticity goes, so you don't get it. You also make sure there's not too much pump line. Some of those pumps can only go 20 or 30 feet. There are 40 feet, you're getting the wrong dilution. So you put it all together and then you make sure you got the right cleaning chemistry. What you do, you get it diluted right, right temperature, hardness, bam, those things will come clean as they should be each and every time. Remember, look to your standards, your guidelines, put it together, quality management, trend stuff. If you watch it, you can catch something early. And one last tidbit. Your facilities management usually monitors your water when it comes into the plant. Get that figure and compare it to yours, what you're getting. If, if they're off, you know there's something in the pipes or something's going on. So I've tried to put it, I know I went a little over, Kevin, but you could tell I was getting really excited. I like to put these things together. So thanks for putting up with me there, my friend. No, absolutely. And thank you for that, Stephen. I, I think we gave everybody something to think about. One last thing that I'd like to add to what you said real quick is just that, you know, if you do have one of those automated uh, dosing machines for your detergent, I've been in on joint commission surveys where they've surveyed my department and they will ask you, okay, how are you checking to make sure that it's dosing oh. correctly? So every once in a while, whether it's weekly or whatever, however you develop your routine, have that thing pump out into some sort of metered cup so that you can see what the measurement mm -hmm. is and, and compare it to what you wanted it to be and what it's supposed to be according to the IFU and then build that into your quality process. So like just yeah, one but... last thing to think about when, you, when you're getting your accreditation survey and something to put into place in your department. So if you're not doing that, just it's, an, it's a simple thing to do but it's one that many people overlook. So on that note, I think we're running out of time. And uh, I just want to thank you again, Stephen. And, and we'll see you back here for another 10 Factors uh, series. Okay. Take care, Kevin. Bye. All right. Just to quickly recap this episode, we talked about dilution and concentration as one of the 10 factors of cleaning. So remember, our water is our solvent. Detergent is our solute. And our detergents are critical to both our manual and automated cleaning processes. So the detergents, they come as concentrates. They must be diluted with water or solvent in order to get the correct and effective concentration. We often rely on automated equipment to provide the correct concentration, but we must check the dosing equipment regularly to ensure that it is still working. And then when it comes to our manual cleaning process, we need to make sure our people understand how many gallons of water to add. We also touched on the different sources of water, potable and critical water supplies, because some of these factors really go together. I hope you're enjoying this series on the 10 factors of cleaning. Please continue to listen and share our podcast 
Give us a rating and review. And thank you all for listening. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.